Where do keys come from if you didn't go to MIT? Hello, I'm Philip Ann Baker, and in the last module of COVID cryptography, we looked at the Kerberos Key Distribution Service, which is a great system which allows anybody on the MIT campus to establish a secure communication channel with any other system on the campus, provided that they have a shared secret with the key distribution system and the resource that they're trying to access also has that shared secret. In th so that's powerful, but it would really not work so well as the basis of internet commerce. I mean, if you do you think Amazon would have taken off if you had to go to a kiosk and exchange a shared secret with that kiosk before you could buy things online at Amazon? And, you know, what if you wanted to go to um, eBay or somebody else? You know, if everybody had to diff have a kiosk, you know, it really wouldn't work the same, would it? In this module, we're going to be looking at public key cryptography, which is the technology which has allowed internet commerce to, square, to scale so far and so fast. Internet commerce might have happened without public key cryptography, but it would have taken decades instead of years. Now, a warning in that there is some math ahead. Uh, and in particular, we're going to be using a branch of mathematics called metamathematics. What's that about? Well, uh, when we're talking about stream ciphers, we talked about clock arithmetic or modular arithmetic to give it a proper name. And modular arithmetic is one example of what is known as a group. Group theory was uh, one of the things invented by uh, Galois, the French Hamilton guy who died in a duel at 20 uh, after inventing the foundation of modern computer science mathematics, really. Uh, group theory is tremendously important to a wide range of computer science applications. And the reason is group theory allows us to make, to use mathematical reasoning about computer programs. It allows us to make, uh, rash, ra, ra, uh, to argue that this computer program is the same as this computer program, which is really important if you're wanting to do optimization of a compiler or whatever. So what is group theory? Well, the basic idea is this. Certain operations like addition and multiplications in the integer calculation, they have um, certain properties or ax what we call axioms, such as closure. Uh, if you add two integers, the result is always an integer. If you multiply two integers, the result is always an integer. If you're doing clock arithmetic, if you add two integers, the result will always be another integer within that uh, clock modular the prime, whatever the modulus of the group is. Uh, there's associativity, which says that if you have A plus B plus C, well, you can calculate that as A plus B and then add C, or you can add C to the result of B plus C. And then there's commutativity, which says that A times B is the same as B times A, and so on. And so, the basis of metamathematics is that we have these properties of a particular calculus and separating out the properties from the calculus itself turns out to be incredibly useful. Why is that? Well, think about this. Say a mathematician sits up all night, comes up with some proof that has to do with you know, some integers or whatever. That can be interesting and useful, but it only applies to the integers. However, if we look underneath the proof and we look at the proof and it says, OK, this proof depends upon the associativity law and it depends upon the closure law and nothing else, then we can say, oh, aha, this law is not just true of the integers, it's also true of integers doing modular arithmetic. It's true of um, rational numbers. It's true of points on elliptic curve. And so what we have there is a tremendous way of 
increasing the productivity of mathematicians. So instead of making um, assertions about one specific system that's limited to that specific system, we can make much more general statements. And that's why we can use mathematics to model computer programs because we can take advantage of all these laws from mathematics that have been developed for integers that happen to be true for anything that's a group that will then apply to the laws of Occam programming or whatever. So, that, so that's going to be coming up. So that's just a warning. Okay, so what's our key distribution problem? Well, let's go through it in order. We started off looking at one-time pads. Though a one-time pad allows Alice and Bob to have a confidential conversation, provided that they previously transferred exactly as much cipher stream uh, from Alice to Bob as the conversation they're going to have. So it works, but it's impractical. AES allows Alice and Bob to have a confidential conversation, but this time, instead of requiring them to exchange all that cipher stream, they only need to exchange 128 bits or 256 bits of key, which has greatly, imp you know, greatly reduced the problem. And now Kerberos allows Alice to have a convers secure conversation, not just between Alice and Bob, but Alice and Carol, Doug, Edward, everybody else, provided that Alice has a key shared with the key distribution center and Bob does and Carol and whoever else. And so what we get to is the idea of cryptography as a sort of means of compressing the problem. Cryptography is allowing us to reduce the size of the problem. A Kerberos, which allows us to have one shared secret, is much simpler to use than regular encryption, where I have to have a separate shared secret with everybody I want to talk with. And that, in turn, is a heck of a lot more lot simpler than having to exchange cipher stream with everybody before I talk to them. So the problem is reduced by the use of cryptography. But here's the rub. The problem is reduced in size. It isn't actually eliminated. All that cryptography, all your encryption is doing is reducing your problem from exchanging the cipher stream, which is huge, to a key which is small, but you've still got that problem of distributing the key. So how can Alice send a confidential email to Bob if they've not exchanged that uh, cipher stream in advance? Uh, well, the there's an answer to that, and the answer was first found at GCHQ, where a guy called James Ellis called it no secret cryptography when, it, when he invented it in 1970. And GCHQ was the uh, successor to Bletchley Park. It's a top secret British uh, cipher school. And when it was invented, it, nobody could figure out how to implement this system until a guy called Clifford Cox came along who worked out a system uh, that we now know as RSA. And then another person, Malcolm Williamson, uh, invented uh, another system which we now know as Diffie-Hellman. And so all that work, you know, it's pioneering, but it didn't go anywhere because it was all top secret classified. So nobody from, none of that work actually led to anything in the real world. Uh, and Whit Diffie, who, as we will see, was um, one of the fathers of uh, public key cryptography, uh, at least the public public key cryptography, uh, he heard a rumour about uh, something happening at GCHQ, travelled to meet Ellis, and after they had a long discussion about many other things, uh, he slipped in at the end, he said, well, tell me how you invented public key cryptography. And Ellis sort of like, uh, looks, uh, well, I, I don't know what I, how much I should say, but let me just say, you people made much more of it than we did. And I think that that's an important piece to bear in mind in that it's not really just the having the idea for the algorithm that's important. It's also working out how to put it to work. Cryptography that isn't put to work isn't particularly interesting or useful in my view. 
Okay, so what was that great idea? Well, AS, DES, and so on, they're all symmetric ciphers. They use the same key to encrypt and decrypt. That's why we call them symmetric. Anybody who can encrypt can also decrypt. Using the same key for both means that you can't separate the roles. Anybody who can encrypt can decrypt means that we cannot publish the encryption key in a telephone book. If we separate the roles, if we have uh, a different key for encryption and a different key for decryption, and there's no way of finding the decryption key from the encryption key that has an acceptable work factor, well, at that point, we can publish the encryption key, the public key, in the telephone book, and anybody can encrypt a message to the public key, and only the person who knows the private key, the decryption key, can decrypt it. And that is the idea of public key cryptography, separating out the roles of the keys. Now, the public uh, discovery of public key cryptography um, started off in Stanford uh, with uh, Marty Hellman's group. Uh, one of uh, his uh, students, uh, Ralph Merkel, came up with an idea that was kind of like a forerunner that's known as Merkel's Puzzles. I won't go into that because it's mainly historical. And then uh, a few years later, Whit Diffie came up with uh, what we now understand to be public key cryptography. And he wrote a paper with Marty Hellman, uh, the 1976 paper, New Directions in Cryptography, which describes the Diffie-Hellman um, crypto system uh, that was the first um, publicly known crypto system um, in that is described in that paper. So Diffie-Hellman is a public key crypto system, but it's not a public key encryption scheme. It does something similar, as we'll see. It does key exchange. The, the Stanford group also came up with a public key encryption system uh, known as Merkel-Hellman knapsack puzzles. Uh, which is faster than the RSA system at the time, but turned out to be faulty. And you know, at some point, we'll do another module on how NAPSAT systems were broken, because that tells us something about the type of problem we need in cryptography. But, um, but public key encryption was out there as a deal. How does it work? Well, to send a message to Bob, Alice is going to look up Bob's public encryption key in the telephone book. She's going to encrypt her message under the encryption key, send the ciphertext to Bob. Bob is then going to take out his decryption key that only he has, decrypt the message and read it. That's public key encryption. And in the normal run of things, the normal course, what would happen here would be we describe Diffie-Hellman and then we describe RSA, which is a true public key encryption scheme, and kind of like Diffie-Hellman would be the afterthought, and uh, you know the SA in the craft. This is going to be different, and the reason for that is that the field has moved on since, and how we regard Diffie-Hellman has changed uh, over the past uh, five to ten years, and I'll get back to that in a moment. So RSA was the first practical uh, public key crypto system that was widely used. It was invented at MIT by Rivesh Shamir and Edelman, whose initials make up the algorithm, in 1977. And it's a true public key encryption scheme. Um, it also supports digital signatures, which we'll get to in the next module. And for the first two, three decades of the commercial crypto industry, RSA was the workhorse algorithm of the field. And it's still in use, but it's rapidly showing its age. And um, until another complication came along a few years about, uh, a few years ago, um, it was starting to be phased out. And the reason for that is work factor. RSA is secure uh, as far as the work factor is concerned, uh, according to current computing capabilities, but in order to get uh, an acceptable work factor, 
we need to use very large numbers, which means that we have to use very large keys. And in the 1980s, 512-bit uh, keys were considered okay for doing uh, RSA. 512-bit uh, RSA keys, they've now been broken, uh, don't use them. Uh, by the 1990s, we'd moved on and told people, well, you really need to have 1,024 bits if your encryption is going to be acceptably secure. And now 1,024-bit RSA hasn't been broken yet, but it's getting there. I think the current best factoring result is uh, getting close to 900 bits. Uh, and so by 2000, we were telling people, no, you really must use at least 2048 bits of RSA. And so you're probably going to expect me to say, well, we need, we're going to need to do another doubling to 4096, and I'm not. And here's why. If you do a plot of key size against work factor, um, key size of 1024 bit RSA gives you a work factor equivalent to uh, 2 to the 80. So an 80 bit work factor. 2048, 112. 3072, 128. So we've got to go to, so the current standard for uh, RSA encryption, 2048 bit keys, that doesn't even meet our 128 bit work factor I talk about as the minimum acceptable work factor for uh, crypto today. Uh, we've got to go even further for that. And to get that higher level of 256 bits of security, you need to have keys that are 15,360 bits long. And that's seriously large. You know, this is a key that's too large to fit in a single standard Ethernet packet. And that has real implications for how you write protocols. Um, the size of the key is starting to get it seriously in the way. It's not just the size of the keys that's a problem either. Longer keys mean longer processing time as well. And uh, your processing time will go up with the square of the number of bits. And so if you move from a 1024-bit key to a 4096-bit key, you will be doing 16 times as much work, which uh, was something of a surprise to uh, my friend Barbara Fox which, when she was um, setting up a PKI in the very early days of uh, public key cryptography and the safe keeper box that they were using, which has a very slow processor in it. Um, they were expecting it to take uh, a few minutes to generate a 4096-bit key pair, it took five hours or something and uh, they were doing it in the middle of a ski ceremony uh, which was expensive okay so the search was up uh, so for the past 10 years or so the search had been on for an alternative to rsa and people started looking back at the diffie hellman scheme which it allows us to do similar stuff uh, but in a different way and in particular we started looking at a, a variation of Diffie-Hellman, applying the Diffie-Hellman problem to a different group. Instead of applying the Diffie-Hellman problem to finite field arithmetic, we applied it to point addition on an elliptic curve. Now, I'm not going to go into what point addition on elliptic curves is uh, in this presentation. I'll get to that in a, a, at some point in the future. But the point is that we can just, uh, because of that metamathematics, because of group theory, what we can do is we can develop all the proofs of security for our Diffie-Hellman based cryptography using the finite field modular arithmetic problem. And all those proofs and all those security criteria carry over to doing Diffie-Hellman in the elliptic field which is really neat. Okay, so, and when we did that, we started to discover uh, over the past five years, we, we started to discover something interesting, which is Diffie-Hellman is actually a more interesting crypto system. And the reason for that is that Diffie-Hellman is a lot simpler than the RSA crypto system. And that simplicity means 
that we can start to do math on Diffie-Hellman key pairs. And that capability is really important because that's the capability that allows us to uh, achieve threshold cryptography, which is the next step beyond public key. It's, the it's, not, it's still public key cryptography, not a replacement. It's a next version of public key cryptography where we introduce more roles by further dividing the keys. Okay, so that's to come in the future as well. And so we, I was discussing this with Wit on a uh, mailing list and you know, he, he said, well, the problem is I set up the question wrong. We didn't really need public key encryption. What we needed was a means of establishing shared secrets to encrypt. And had we understood that at the start, we might have started with Diffie-Hellman and never gone down uh, the uh, blind, what's turned out to be a blind alley. And the reason that RSA is a blind alley is because there are actually no practical public key encryption schemes. None. One RSA encryption operation takes a few milliseconds. Doesn't sound much, but it's only encrypting a few hundred bytes. And what this means is that you cannot use RSA in any sensible way to encrypt a movie or anything like that. You have to use RSA in combination with a symmetric cipher. So we generate a random number, which is called the session key. We encrypt that with RSA. We pass that along the, with the d encrypted data. The recipient decrypts the, that, mod, that packet with uh, R, their RSA key, get the session key back, and then they can decrypt the data. And so we don't actually use RSA to do the encryption of the data. We use RSA to do the key distribution. And had we really understood the consequences of that, we could have been using Diffie-Hellman all along. And there's another result that came up quite early in the field, which is that Dorothy Denning showed us that not only is this uh, business about using the session key, it's not just a matter of efficiency. You have to do that uh, wrapping of the session key in order to get the necessary security properties. And the reason for that is that the security of the RSA algorithm is not even. The, the, the final bit is encrypted more efficiently than, to, is, is, is harder to discover than the uppermost bits. And so there's this whole business of uh, padding that comes into the design of RSA encryption schemes. And again, we'll come back to that at some point in the future. So doing RSA right is non-trivial and actually quite a bit uh, complicated. Diffie-Hellman is a lot more straightforward. It it's a key agreement scheme. So the output of Diffie-Hellman is a shared secret, which is exactly what we're looking for for our key distribution scheme. And we only use some very basic um, properties of our underlying group. So the first property that we depend upon is that multiplication is commutative. So A times B is always the same as B times A. And that's the same for regular integer uh, multiplication and the same for modular multiplication as well. The second thing that we use is an exponent. So if we take G times G times G times G times G, well, because multiplication is associative, that means that we can group these terms in any way we like and we will always come up with the same result. And so because we always come up with the same result, we can give it a notation of its own and we call that g to the power x. So if we've got x g's multiplied together, the result is g to the power x. And so now if we take g to the power a and raise that result to the power b, what we will end up is g multiplied by itself a times and then those g's, all a of them, multiplied by themselves 
b times so we will have g multiplied by itself a times b times so it's like a rectangle of g's all multiplied together and so if we do e to the power b to the power a well that will be e to the power so that will be g to the power b times a which is the same as g to the power a times b so what that means is that we can take these exponential terms we can raise g to the power a to the power b and we'll get exactly the same result as g to the power b to the power a same result anytime and that holds for any associative operation so it'll be true for any group because groups are by definition associative so we can implement Diffie-Hellman using just integers. Alice is going to pick uh, a, an integer a as her private key. Her public key is going to be e to the power a. B is Bob is going to pick b as his private key. His pub public key is going to be g to the power b. And they can then both calculate the value g to the power a times b using the information that is available to them. And this is a powerful result. Uh, there's only one small problem. That is that exponentials are now smooth functions. You know, we've known how to take the inverse of an exponential you know, since Newton's day. Um, there's an inverse. It's called the logarithm. And so that doesn't work for cryptography. What does? Well, the discrete logarithm. Instead of working in the regular integers, we change the group from the regular integers to modulo arithmetic. And that meet, provides us with a problem in which that nice smooth exponential has turned into something that looks a lot more random and distributed. It's not perfectly random and distributed. There's still some structure there, uh, but it's a lot more random. And the work factor of un unpicking it is a lot higher. And so if we take e to the power a mod, sorry, g to the power a mod p, where p is a prime, it's calculating a from that g to the a value mod p is very hard. The discrete logarithm is a known hard problem, and the, the difficulty of that problem is um, relate, strongly related to the pr difficulty of the factoring problem. And so our key agreement value is going to be g to the power a times b, which is, you know, it's a shared secret, but it isn't, you know, it's, a, it's one of the wrong size to fit into AES. We can't use that uh, directly. And so what we're going to do with that is we're going to process it to get a, a symmetric key out. And the piece of technology we use for that is, of course, a key derivation function. Uh, the same key derivation function we use to generate uh, encryption keys from passwords in the previous module. And so we have a KDF in there. Uh, this is one of those things that often gets left out of the diagrams. Uh, but it's just a piece of basic crypto uh, utility functionality that needs to be there, but is often overlooked. So KDF goes in there. OK, so now we've got a new version in which Alice is going to have g to the a mod p as a public key and a as a private key. Bob is going to have the same with b as his public private key pair. And now they can both calculate e to the power b times a mod p by different routes. Alice is going to uh, use Bob's public key and raise it to her private key. And Bob is going to uh, raise um, Alice's public key to his private key. So they both do the same operation, but on different data. So they're doing it in different order. So the way that we're going to use this to exchange a, an encrypted message is Alice is going to do the exchange, send her public key and the data over, and then Bob is going to do the reverse. And we're getting somewhere, but there's a small problem, and that is that every message from Bob, from Alice to Bob, is going to be encrypted under the same key, and that's icky, especially if we're going to use a stream cipher. You know, then it's 
you know, useless. So we've got to have some way of varying the key. And the other problem is that neither Alice nor Bob can control the key that's actually going to be used for encrypting. And that's a bit of a hassle. Uh, if we're going to send the same message to multiple people, we don't really want to have to encrypt that message separately for each of the possible recipients. You know, if it's a if it's a movie, 10 gigabytes, re-encrypting that movie, uh, that gets tiresome very fast. And so what we want to do is to be able to encrypt the data once under one randomly chosen session key and just encrypt the session key. Similar trick to what we were doing with RSA. And that is called key wrapping. We generate a session key. We use the key, the output of the key derivation function to encrypt that, send that over, decrypt it on the other side, and the session key is used for, as the bulk cipher. Another of those cryptographic utility functions that is extremely important but often missed out of explanations. So we're getting somewhere, but we don't really want to use the same encryption key every time to encrypt the data. And there's a couple of ways that we could do that. One is we could simply um, insert a different nonce into the key derivation function each time. And there are some cases in which that's what you want to do. Another way and a, a more powerful way of doing it is what's called Algamal encryption. And the way it works is this. To send a message to Bob, Alice is first of all going to generate a completely new public-private key pair. She's going to use the private part to establish a shared secret with um, Bob. Uh, and then she's going to send the public part of that uh, key pair to Bob along with the encrypted message. Bob is then going to use that ephemeral key, as we call it, to uh, and his private key to get the shared secret and decrypt the message. And this approach has some very interesting properties. One of them is that Alice has got no way of decrypting this message after she sent it unless she took some step to um, either send an encrypted copy to herself or remembered the ephemeral key in some way. And this is a, an important cryptographic building block for what's called perfect forward secrecy, which we'll come back to at some point in the future. So it's a powerful system. And if we use um, finite fields, if we use modular arithmetic, it's got a work factor that's pretty much acceptable. It's the same, uh, the, the difficulty is similar to that of the factoring problem. And we're gonna need to use the same sort of key sizes as RSA. So they're large, not yet unacceptably large. But as with RSA, you know, it's a system that's starting to show its wear. Uh, finite fields are just not a sufficiently difficult problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a different field. We're going to change from using modular arithmetic as the basis for our crypto system to using point addition on elliptic curves. And I'll come back to how that actually works later on. At this point, we'll just take the group part as a black box. But the point is that we can take all that math that I just showed you for Diffie-Hellman and we can apply it to elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman without making uh, major modifications. And there are many elliptic curves out there. But the ones that we've kind of come to an agreement on using in the field are two. Uh, and those are the uh, curve ba curves based on the prime 2 to the power 255 minus 19. And, curve, and the curve based on 2 to the power 448 minus 2 to the power 224 minus 1, which is called curve 448. And those provide us with 128-bit and 224-bit security. And so at this point, some of you are probably asking, 224, why is your upper bound 224 bits, not 256 bits? And that's the point at which the answer is, 
because there is a reason whether it's a good one or not um, depends upon who you are different people had different uh, views on that whether we should go for maximum speed or maximum security uh, I'll come back to that when we talk about elliptic curves so at this point we've got a pretty good public key encryption system Alice can send her encrypted messages to Bob or to anybody else people that she's never met and she doesn't even need to have a registered public key to do it but it is a system not just an algorithm it's not just the Diffie Hellman key exchange it's also Tahar Al Gamal's um, ephemeral key it's also the key derivation function and also potentially that key wrapping it's a system not just one algorithm and it's powerful and that's the basis for providing confidentiality in internet commerce but confidentiality integrity availability CIA integrity is more important than confidentiality availability is more important than integrity we've looked at the confidentiality applications of public key cryptography what about the integrity applications what does splitting the message authentication code generation key from the message authentication verification key give us is it useful well actually that gets us to digital signatures and those turn out to be quite possibly the most important and useful feature of any type of cryptography of them all and those are going to be the next the subject of our next module digital signatures so please join me for that please hit like please subscribe and thank you very much for getting to the end of this so I can get my completion rate thank you very much